thanks, everybody. Um, so several things are just kind of not, not normal. Um, so the first thing is, I mean, as everybody probably knows by now, I normally have incredible problems actually getting my laptop talking to the projector. And today, it's gone absolutely seamlessly. So something else is going to go wrong, <laughs> almost, almost certainly, just to, just to compensate for that. Um, uh, What's the other thing? Oh, yes, right. So one other thing is that um, uh, people who've seen me talk before, before know that I always massively overrun. Um, so this time, I mean, I've set a stopwatch. And um, after 20 minutes, I should be doing demos. If I'm not doing tw demos after 20 minutes, then could someone please kind of like shout at me? Um, anyway, OK, so what am I talking about? So I'm talking about tight-level Scala rebooted. Um, what does that mean? Well, first question is, what is tight-level? So type level, I guess, by now, is beginning to get to be um, uh, it's beginning to get to be a thing. People are beginning to um, recognize that there is a, a collection of projects, a bunch of people uh, with opinions about how to do functional programming in Scala. Uh, type level is um, a, an, an entity of sorts um, which um, which uh, represents um, those people and those ideas, um, and um, it's organized around a kind of set of general principles, um, which are, I guess, I suppose you, if you, you could describe it as kind of a mission statement. Um, some of them are technical, some of them are non-technical. Um, so to start with the technical um, point, we're interested in pure functional programming uh, typeful in the sense that you can you can you can do you can do you can do functional programming without being particularly interested in types. We are very definitely interested in types. Um, primarily, um, the projects which which make up Type Level as a, as an organisation are all um, they're, they're all free Libra open source projects. Uh, I say independent in the sense that for the most part they don't have backing from any commercial entities. They are, as it were, grassroots community projects built by. Uh, developers in the trenches who want to solve interesting problems using pure functional programming and types. Um, uh, this is hardly kind of unique in the Scala in the ecosystem or indeed anywhere else, but, but we also have some, some, some fairly firm thoughts about how we actually want to try and reach out to people and make this stuff accessible to people, make it possible for people to, to use this stuff. Um, and for that to be possible, uh, we need to be willing to share ideas and code. Uh, we need to make um, uh, all of the projects that are, are participants in, in, in type level um, um, uh, easy for people to get on board with. Um, and we need to make people feel that they're welcome particularly at the beginning when they don't necessarily know everything about how to do uh, everything about how to do uh, implicit proofs in Scala's type system um, we need to, we need to we, we need to make people uh, aware that they can they can they can come join us learn and get something out of this kind of stuff and I think for the best description of the kind of the model that we want to have for this this sort of community uh, Eric's uh, talk that he did last year at Scala world is absolutely perfect for that so I, I highly recommend uh, if people are interested in following that through to look at that. OK, so that's type level. So what's type level Scala? So the background is that at the end of 2014, um, uh, we, when I say we, I mean, I mean uh, some uh, of the people associated with some of the most kind of prominent type level projects decided that, the, that not enough progress was being made in the mainstream Scala compiler on some of the particular um, things um, that were of concern to us uh, was being made. And that really, the only way to fix these problems was to sort of take, take the initiative ourselves and try and uh, work on those ourselves. Um, so we, 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 we kicked off the fork at the end of 2014. Um, the aim was explicitly to address um, the uh, the, 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 the issues that we found um, in, um, uh, in working in the kind of style that, that's exemplified by the type level projects. Um, completely stalled at the beginning of 2015. Um, the primary reason for that is um, uh, we needn't, 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 needn't really distract us here, but, but in practice, the real reason was that at the beginning of 2015, pretty much everybody who would have been working on type level Scala was working on the CATS project instead, uh, which essentially meant that there, were just, there was just no bandwidth, no resources for anything, uh, for anything to be done with it. Um, also, we kind of found that there was a number of, a number of 
ways of kind of edging around the problem. So we, we the um, people were working with compiler plugins. So for example, things like um, Eric's uh, Kind Projector was a kind of very important example of that. Macros such as the ones you find in Shapeless, um, or uh, perhaps uh, the things that, um, uh, for example, you find in uh, Simulacrum, which again, again, Eric talked about this morning. These, 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 these basically paper over some of the cracks, and they make, they make some, of the, some of the more pain, painful experiences of trying to program in, in, in the type level style uh, less painful. Um, but they didn't really fix all the problems, and there still are issues. Um, some of them, um, were, well, in particular, uh, things like um, SI2712. I will, I, will, I will come back later and explain exactly what this is. But in summary, it's a problem with um, uh, a failure of type inference in, in Scala, in, in Scala's type checker, which is particularly um, uh, difficult to deal with um, for people who are working um, with uh, high kinded types uh, in Scala. Um, so this, this absolutely uh, affects um, uh, libraries like CATS, libraries like Scala Z, and many, many others. Um, and there haven't really been, well, I mean, there, there haven't been any um, sort of very, very low level sort of extension style um, solutions available to this problem. I don't think anybody had ever really considered that it might be possible um, to, um, uh, to fix this via, via a macro, for example, or via a, a compiler plugin, um, because it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an issue which is sort of embedded deep down in the bowels of, 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 of Scala's type checker, and, and you don't really have any straightforward way of, 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 of getting hold of the relevant mechanics and, and persuading the Scala compiler to do the right thing. There are higher level, there are actually embeddings, sorry, encodings rather, to use um, kind of Eric's terminology from this from this morning, which which actually enable you to work around these things. So, for example, I think most people who've worked with CATS or Scala Z will have had the experience of working with, um, have had experiences of type inference failures, which they are cryptically advised to. Oh, you can solve that with unapply, um, or if, instead of using traverse, you use traverse u, which sort of sneakily brings in an unapply instance. So basically, what what we ended up doing, um, because because there wasn't a sort of a, a lower level. Um, sort of extension-like mechanism available, we ended up building up these sort of towers of encodings, um, which, which, which kind of work. I mean, they, did, they, definitely, they definitely, in some sense or another, they solved the problem. However, they come with, a, they come with an enormous cost. I mean, the cost is, is both conceptual, because you, you end up in a situation, and we maybe see some examples a little bit later on, where, where, where things which are, should be conceptually very, very simple become sort of encrusted in, in, in these, these sort of elaborate mechanisms which are there solely to work around a problem which should be solved um, really ultimately at, at the compiler level. Um, so um, I, I'm, I, I'm at least uh, uh, at least partly responsible for for unapply. I think I think I think um, uh, perhaps I think I, I came up with the, 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 the initial idea of using uh, uh, kind of implicit um, search as a as a mechanism for effectively using doing type level programming uh, in in the Scala type system to solve to work around a failure of type inference. Um, so I'm 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 guilty. I'm responsible for for uh, uh, lots of this this encrusted stuff. Um, um, I, I, I hadn't myself actually had to use it very much because, um, uh, although although I mean, Shapeless, Shapeless seems like a very fancy, sophisticated library with lots of types in it, actually Shapeless doesn't use higher kinded types very much at all. Um, so it was primarily people in, say, the cat's domain um, who, who were experiencing the, the, the pain of, of SI2712 more. Um, however, with the sort of the increasing sort of collaboration between type level projects that, that sort of arrived with um, sort of type level becoming a thing, um, I decided to spend some time working on uh, writing, um, uh, doing, using Shapeless to, to automatically drive uh, type classes for the kinds of type classes you find in CAT. So for example, for functor, for monoid, for, uh, sorry, monoid K. Um, so in other words, for, higher kind, uh, for type classes indexed by, by higher kinded types. And all of a sudden, I ran slap bang into exactly the same problems with, 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 um, with um, type inference that, that, that everybody working in CATs had always, always been dealing with. So I, I um, at, at Scala World last year, I kind of, I kind of announced I've come up with this new, uh, elaborate, clunky, encoded workaround for, um, for um, uh, coming up with uh, for, for solving this particular problem. Um, 
and, and it works, and it's, it's, it's quite nice, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, but again, it's another, it's another layer of sort of encrusted encoding on top of what should actually be a simple problem. So um, I was going to be doing a talk at Flatmap earlier this year, uh, and I was going to present this new, this, new, this new workaround, and I thought, well, if I'm going to be doing that, let's see if I can um, see what the current state of play, if we decided to kind of go back to, to, to look at type-level Scala, what, um, what, what, what's, what, what's, 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 what's the current status on? How can we actually, uh, is, do we, do we are we any closer to having an inkling of an idea to how to, how to fix the problem? So I, I kind of I kind of stuck my neck out. I had no idea at this point whether it was going to be possible, but I thought, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have a stab at this. Um, um, and I was going to present this as a sort of this is a possibility um, at the end of my talk, um, but it actually turned out that. Um, uh, once I actually started digging into the compiler, it turned out that actually this problem was nothing like as hard as we had all imagined. Um, and, and, and it turned out that it, it yielded to a little, bit of, a little bit of digging around, a little bit of effort, a lot of cooperation and help and assistance from, from the, the, uh, the Light Ben Scala compiler team, from Jason and Adrian and, uh, and Lucas and everybody else. Um, it also turned out um, that... Um, um, that uh, the sort of the tooling around the Scala compiler has massively improved over the last couple of years. Um, it used to have um, a, an absolutely uh, impenetrable uh, ant-based build, very, very, very elaborate. I mean, inevitably, I mean, a, a compiler is, is, is a sophisticated piece of software. One of the things you have to do when building compilers is you have to verify them by bootstrapping them. They have to be able to compile themselves, and then you have to be convinced that the result of compiling the compiler uh, is, is idempotent, that you, know, you, will, you will produce a stable build that will produce the same binaries when compiling, and all, all these kinds of things, which make for a, for a very complicated multi-stage kind of build process. It's very, very difficult to do. So it's, it's, it's understandable the old build was, was, was was awkward and complicated, um, but um, um, but 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 you know the the, the Scala the team at Lightband you know experienced the pain of working with the AMP build. They wanted to work with SBT as well, and and so they put in a huge amount of effort and have produced uh, an SBT build for the Scala compiler now, which is which is frankly wonderful. Um, I, lots of people say unkind things about SBT. Personally, I, I, I find it a, a very useful tool. And what the work they've done on, on the um, Scala compiler build has done, for, for me at least, is it's turned the Scala compiler into just another Scala project that you might um, clone, check out, uh, clone from, from GitHub, um, fiddle around with, tinker with, uh, you know, run some tests and all the rest of it. And that this suddenly has opened up a vista of, of um, the Scala compiler being Something that all of us, everybody in this room, could play a part in 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 in, in working on to, to kind of solve some of the, the, the long-standing problems um, that we're we're experiencing. And the reason these long-standing problems is because you know they are of the ones in particular that we're focusing on, I guess, in type-level Scala, are ones which are of particular interest to people working in the type-level style. That isn't everybody. Um, not everybody has the same interests. And you know, the people working at Lightbend, um, they 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 have they have they have paying customers, um, and they have they have different priorities. They are they they it's perfectly reasonable for them to not necessarily put our interests at the top of their list. So if we want this stuff fixed, we've got to do it ourselves. And they have helped us. To be able to do that, and I think we should we should we should take up that 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 gauntlet, that challenge, and 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 and, and do as much as we can. And I'm absolutely 100% confident, as this merge shows. So the work I did on SI2712 has been merged now. It's now part of Scala 2.12. Um, there is a backport of it available for Scala 2.11.9, um, and and we we need more of this. So 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 this was for me. This was kind of I think kind of going back to what. My, my feelings about this were after, after seeing, in the end, you know, actually, just how easy it really was. I mean, I, 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 I've said this before, I, I guess I should say it again, I, I have no superhuman powers. Uh, even if I did have um, superhuman powers, I wouldn't have needed them to solve this problem. Uh, it's not that difficult. And um, actually, even if you look at the, um, uh, the, the, the ticket in the Scarlet Issue Tracker, um, actually, the, the, even, even the solution was suggested by, by Paul Cisano uh, in one of the comments on the ticket. So, so it had been there in the background for about five or six years. Um, and at any point, someone could have come along and fixed it. 
So I don't want us to end up in this situation again, where we kind of like sort of wake up blinking sort of five years hence and realize some terrible problem that we've all, all been wrestling with for, for years and years and years and building up again more layers of encrusting, in, you know, encrusted encodings, um, when and actually we could have just gone into the compiler and fixed stuff. So I have set myself a kind of, well, at Scala Days in Berlin, I set myself this as a kind of like my, my you know, that was my, um, uh, my New Year's resolution. These are my, my kind of stretch goals for the end of the year. Uh, and I said that what I was going to look at was, well, the original fork of type level Scala, uh, one of the things that was going to go in, um, and, and, and in fact did go in in an early form, uh, was this thing called 42.type. Um, it's, it exists as a SIP, um, which is one of the sort of the Scala improvement documents that, um, that, uh, that, that are supposed to capture some of these kinds of things. Um, what it actually is, represents is um, uh, basically um, providing syntax for something which has semantically always existed in Scala. It's something which is actually used in Shapeless. Uh, so singleton types for, um, for, for, for um, literal values in Scala. We'll, we'll see into some examples of that later on, so I won't digress. Some, a few other problems. All of these things are things which... Um, uh, with the exception of the last, um, all of these things are things which um, involve, um, can be sort of either worked around in some sort of vague, clunky kind of way, but, but with all of them uh, involve layering on additional um, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, additional artifacts which are, which are solely there to, to, to support... Um, uh, to support encodings of things which could be expressed directly. Um, so multiple implicit parameter blocks, if we had those, um, I, if, if people have, have, have worked with Shapeless and have wondered what the AUX pattern is in Shapeless, the AUX pattern is effectively a workaround for the lack of multiple implicit parameter blocks. Partial type application, well, um, I think this is, this is something that people often want. They, 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 they will often have um, situations where they have methods or types which have multiple type parameters. They want to be able to um, uh, provide some of them in explicitly and have the remainder inferred. Um, and, and again, there are, there are workarounds. You can sort of split your, split your types, your methods into two two parts, one which has an explicitly uh, provided set of type parameters, one of which has inferred type parameters. Um, but this is, this is cumbersome. This, is, this, this creates extra, extra noise, something which is actually fundamentally very simple. Uh, and I maintain um, uh, uh, that, that you know, things like shapeless are actually, when it comes down to it, fundamentally very simple. But the, the sort of the simplicity of them is, is masked by kind of layers of, of, of workarounds and craft and encodings. So if we can peel of this stuff off, if we can, if we can, if we can, if we can, if we can sort of remove the syntactic noise that sits on top of this stuff, I think, I think we end up in a place which is, you know, the sort of the happy land that Haskell is um, frolic in, where, where everything, everything looks beautiful and, and pristine and elegant. Actually, we have the same um, expressive power that they do, but, but, but it's, it's sort of hidden away. Um, the last bullet on the list, so this was from, this was from, from Scala Days, was Core Scala. This is something which, which the Scala Center, in, in some form or another, have been talking about. They're talking about, various, um, they're talking about a Scala platform uh, and are talking about, in conjunction with that, a notion of, of there being alternative platforms. So, for example, there could be a type-level variant of the Scala platform. This is something that type-level is, is very, very keen on. We are delighted to, if we, uh, to be able to cooperate with the Scala Center on, on something along those lines. So that's, uh, that's a great thing as well. And that, that's also something which, which requires some degree of uh, modification to the Scala compiler itself and also the standard library and the Scala compiler because there are various sort of hardwired assumptions in the compiler about what things are available in the environment. So all of these things are, are things that I put down on my shopping list. Um, we've made progress on this. So um, the literal type stuff is done and, and that now exists as a, as a pull request against Scala uh, 2.12x. It's not going to go in 2.12.0. Hopefully it will, um, uh, it will go through all the bookkeeping and stuff and it will arrive in Scala um, 2.12.1. I think that's, that's, that's the plan. Uh, the multiple implicit parameter blocks, that's, the, that's, that's actually on hold. Um, there was a pull request against, um, against 2.12. Um, Again, that turned out to be incredibly easy to do. Um, I, I initially put together a very, very simple version uh, of, of uh, a fix to this idea. It's the simplest possible thing that would actually be useful, which is to allow multiple implicit parameter lists at the, at the end 
of a set of parameter lists. Uh, and that turns out to be sort of syntactically very you know, conservative in the sense that nothing, nothing, nothing changes in it. All existing programs continue to compile without, without any issues whatsoever. It's a, it's a very conservative option. Dotty uh, either has or is planning to have something uh, a little bit more elaborate, which allows sort of arbitrary interleaving of, of uh, explicit and implicit parameter lists, which is actually more in line with the kinds of things you see in languages like Agda and Idris. Uh, and ultimately, I think, uh, I think that, that that's the right thing to do. I think, I think Dottie's made the right choice here. Um, so um, uh, I, I, I was wondering whether or not Adrian, Adrian Moores would be open to the idea of something more ambitious. And I talked to him about this at Scala, Scala Days in Berlin. And he, he said, yeah, actually, the more ambitious thing is something that, that would definitely be a possibility for 2.12. So I think that's, that's on hold. We'll kind of revise the, we'll come up with, a, with an alternative proposal, which is, which is more in tune with, uh, you know, uh, Idris and Dotty, and, and, and hopefully get something something out of that. Um, the improved time compile time for inductive implicits. Well, people may have seen me tweeting a couple of weeks ago about some rather dramatic results on that. I'll, I'll show you those at the end of the day. So we're definitely making progress on that. That will be coming to a type level Scala compiler near you within within a matter of weeks or possibly possibly a month or two. But anyway, it's well on it's well underway. Okay, so that's that's the early progress. So okay, these are all things we're doing and which I'm sure everybody thinks sounds wonderful, but can you actually use it? Can you use it? Can you use it in your day job? I mean, this is the key thing for me. There's not really, I mean, everybody who's working on tight level projects, um, they're, not, they're not doing it for fun. They're not doing it because it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a hobby, it's light entertainment. They're doing it because these are uh, professional software developers who are developing, building this stuff and using it in their day job. So if we do this, um, uh, if, we, if we make these changes and we want people to, to use them, it has to be possible for people to go to their employer, or if they are their employer, to make that decision themselves, um, and, um, uh, and say, right, we're going we're, we're to use the type-level Scala compiler, uh, and we're going to use it to build code, which we're going to put into production systems. If we can't do that, if we can't provide people with, with assurance that that's not a crazy, crazy idea that's going to loosen their, their job, then there really isn't very much point doing this stuff. So, so we have come up with... Um, okay, that's... <laughs> Use it, uh, use it in principle, use it now, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so to be able to do that, um, there need to be constraints um, on what we are going to do with type-level Scala. So um, we need all of our releases of type-level Scala be to be, to be uh, compatible, binary compatible with the existing ecosystem. It's not feasible to, um, uh, to expect people to essentially rebuild. We have some ideas along the lines of how you might be able to sort of, if you like, um, stack uh, Haskell, stackage style, rebuild the entire ecosystem. But in practice, we are in, in, on the JVM, we are very dependent on binaries, and uh, we need to be able to retain binary compatibility with the ecosystem. We can't expect everything to move at once. Uh, this is, has to be something which is gradual. Um, there have got to be big wins from doing it, so there's no point putting fiddly little details into So one of the first contributions I personally made to the original fork of type level Scala was um, uh, adding a uh, little primes to the uh, the ability to have primes at the end of identifiers because it, if you you know if you read if you read academic papers in in, in sort of journal of functional programming in Haskell you'll see they'll, they'll work their way through a bunch of definitions like foo foo prime foo prime prime and I always felt really really awkward writing zero one two or something like that and I, I want primes as well so I and it's a trivial change to the scala parser you can do it you can do it in five minutes um, but there is no point in my opinion in in in, in having a um, a, a, a Scala compiler fork simply to be able to support that kind of stuff. It's got to be stuff that, that provides significant um, uh, bang for the buck, as it were. Um, it's got to be very undisruptive in the sense that it should be as easy as possible to, to, to have your project use type-level Scala. Um, and the risks should be very, very low. I mean, there should be no uh, danger that... Um, I don't know that 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 you know you switch to the type level Scala compiler and you deploy uh, your 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 infrastructure and the missiles fire because of some some change subtle change in, in type inference that you weren't expecting I mean that that, that that we 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 should definitely not expect that to happen. Um, okay, so so that's those are the constraints. I mean I think I mean do do people right got it. Oh crap. Okay, all right. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be overrun again. So okay, I, I do want to finish this bit. Um, so we need to be able to... Um, right, okay, let's go. Um, so, 
So what we're going to do is we're going to track the light bend scalar releases. Um, so the, for, for, for each light, uh, light bend scalar release, there's going to be a type level scalar release. Um, we'll be generating code which is binary compatible with uh, light bend scalar, which means you'll be able to um, basically link type level scalar binaries with light bend scalar binaries and vice versa. And that's absolutely crucial. Um, and to, to, to basically hammer home how this is going to happen, um, the policy for submission of anything into type level Scala is that it must first exist as a pull request against light bend Scala first. Now, there's a bunch of reasons why this is, this is a good thing. First, it's, it's a statement of intent that we really do want this stuff to be merged into, into light bend Scala. This, we're not a fork that's going off on a, on a completely different track. We, we want the stuff to be merged into the main line so that we can, we can use it. Uh, People using type level Scala are, 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 if you like, ahead of the curve, hopefully, but, but ultimately everybody will be able to use those things without having to, to do anything uh, uh, risky or unusual. Um, um, obviously, the pull request can't be sort of, you know, delete all and replace with the source tree for Idris. Um, it's got to be something that has a reasonable probability of, 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 being, of being merged into, into Lightband Scala. Um, it's got to be a significant fix, and, and there shouldn't, it shouldn't be something for which there is a, a, really, straightforward, yeah, a really straightforward workaround. So um, that's that. And binary compatibility, unless binary compatible uh, binary changes is the whole point of the change. OK, so the results are we got a first release out. Um, it's uh, rele rel relative to 2.11.8 at the moment. Um, as, soon as, as soon as there's a... Um, uh, 2.12 release out, there will be a lot of type level Scala corresponding to that. It includes the SI2712 fix, it includes a fix for SI7046, it includes the literal types changes, and it includes some minor GATD fixes, which I'm not going to talk about today. Um, yeah, that's coming soon. Okay. Um, and um, all of these things exist in the form of pull requests against um, 2.12 and 2.11. So ideally, we will see all of these things uh, arriving in a, in a, in a subsequent uh, light and Scala releases. Okay, um, so this is a question I want you to ask. Is it, is it risky to use this under these circumstances? Um, you need to compare that with what are the, what's the, the alternative is not using it. The alternative is not using it and continuing to work with the existing workarounds and, uh, and encodings and contraptions and what have you. Personally, my view is that, um, so for ex there is a form of the SI2712 fix as a compiler plugin. My own personal view um, is that uh, it is less risky to use type level Scala, which has the fix, than it is to use light bend Scala plus the plugin. Because I had to do a whole bunch of really, really horrible monkey patching things to get the plugin to work. And I totally recommend that if you're using the SI2712 fix plugin, you should use type level, type level Scala instead. And there's going to be a whole bunch of issues like this. Um, so I would say that if, if these problems cause you pain, if you, if you have, you know, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you have uh, a code base which is full of unapply, <laughs> then, then, then really seriously you should consider that, that you will actually be making your life easier by, 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 by using it than not using it. And, you know, that, 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 that reduces your risk. Okay, so how do you use it? You just do that. That's it. At the moment, add that to your SBT build, and you're done. I had to do quite a lot of work in SBT to make it work quite that smoothly. Um, Scala organization has been around for a while. It wasn't introduced for type level Scala. It was introduced for Scala virtualized. However, there was a whole bunch of bugs in it, which, because basically it was hardly used, no one had ever run into. Um, but anyway, that is the current state of play. With 2.11.8, you can just add that to your build, and everything will just continue to work. Um, it assumes. That. So currently, there's only a corresponding build for 2.11.8. And it assumes that you're using SBT 0.13.13 RC2 or later, because uh, that's when the Scholar organization fixes arrived. OK. Um, if you want more details, go to um, GitHub Type Level Scholar. Um, so let's have some demos quickly. And I, how long do I have now? Uh, that's good. Perfect. That's great. OK, so SI2712. So let's have a quick look at. Um, Oops. So this is the bug. Um, it's a problem of type inference. So what we're expecting to happen here, so this is, this is the, the ticket on the Scarlet issue tracker. What we're expecting to happen is that um, this is, this is, this is um, uh, an invocation of this method. Uh, we're providing, so the, the method is defined with a type constructor with a single type argument uh, with, um, sorry, a type with a, a 
a type parameter, which is a, a high kind of type with a single type argument. We're expecting it to unify with um, a function one, uh, which is a type, is a, um, uh, which is a uh, type constructor with two type parameters. And basically, the long-standing problem is that um, Scala uh, type checker will never perform that unification if the arities of the type constructors don't match. So the fix is kind of simple, really. You go and find the place where that restriction is imposed, and you generalize it slightly. And there's a, there's a relatively well-known way of doing that, uh, which, which is used in, 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 in Haskell, um, and it, which is to effectively treat um, um, the, 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 bin the binary type constructor as partially applied. So you end up with um, solving, um, uh, solving, so solving M as, uh, as, as function one, as a function from, uh, from, an, in uh, from an integer. Uh, with a hole, a hole in the second place. Um, and this turns out to be pretty easy to do. Um, and I, what I want to show you is, um, first, I think, is um, the effect of using it. And this is, this is kind of why I, what, I, what I mean when I say that um, you know, you've got to compare the risk of using it with the risk of not using it. This is, this is, this is a diff from uh, Pascal. Pascal Voiteau, who is probably here somewhere, he's probably going to be talking about some things which are not unrelated to this code um, uh, later on today. Um, so he uh, basically took his existing code base, which, which was afflicted uh, in multiple ways by SI2712, uh, uh, used an early version of the type level Scala compiler with the fix, and this is the result. This is what he was able to do. Now, I assume everybody is familiar with the difference between red and green in a GitHub diff. So this is where it gets interesting tons and tons of gnarly code, which exists solely to work around failures of type inference, just disappears. Um, lots and lots and lots of it. Uh, there is some, some of this stuff is, I believe, commented out, um, but, but actually the vast proportion of this stuff which is removed is actually real code, um, that, um, real code that needs to be maintained, that it, that it takes, um, uh, you know, someone has to be able to read and understand this. Uh, it has to be compiled. Uh, a lot of it, you can see, it's using tons of implicits and stuff. This is kind of blowing people's compile times out as it goes. Getting rid of this stuff is a huge win. It really is a huge win. Obviously, for, for, for only for, for you know, fairly specialized, um, not specialized, but I mean, the, for, for code written in this style, this is an enormous win. And it's not really a loss to anybody. So I think, I think, I think it's a, a, clear, a clear benefit. I'm not going to show any more about about that one. So SI7046 is, is something that um, affects, um, so Shapeless um, kind of started off as a sort of a toy, a sort of show off project, and sort of evolved into a generic programming library. Um, the main thing that people, that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to encourage people to use it for, and the main thing that people do in practice use it for, is for sort of deriving type class instances for, for algebraic data types. Um, and the, the, the most common application of that is for you know, deriving um, uh, codecs, encoders, decoders for various kinds of serialization forms for, um, for, for, for algebraic data types. Um, there's, there are two big problems that, that everybody encounters when they're doing this, um, which are, number one, SI7046, which I'll demonstrate in a second, and, and long compile time. So I am attempting to fix both of these. Um, and um, SI7046, I will show you now what the effect of that is. Um, so, where is the demo for that? Uh, right, okay, so here's our demo. So, um, this is just a, a, a simple, trivial, trivial little ADT. So this is how we encode ADTs in Scala. We have a sealed trait. It has two, uh, two um, constructors. Um, which extend that, uh, their case classes. Um, so what you would do, um, for example, as you know, this is a, 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 in, in, in microscope, um, what, what you effectively want to do when you're, when you're working generically with um, the, uh, the, 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 the ADT at the root of a, uh, sorry, the trait with the root of uh, the ADT, is you want to turn values into um, things injected into, um, uh, this is like left and right. So this is uh, exactly the stuff that, um, uh, Aaron was talking about uh, in, in his talk earlier on. So, so basically, we have um, a value of the ADT type. We've, we've thrown away the static type information that it's the second constructor, so we just know that it's an instance of this thing. We have a generic uh, instance, which we've magically summoned from via Shapeless's macros uh, for the ADT. And this gives us the ability to inject 
um, a value of the ADT into the corresponding nested either's, sort of lefts and rights. Um, so at this point, we're able to uh, effectively uh, work with um, uh, uh, this is a sort of a generic representation. This is a sort of generic representation of uh, following the ADT down one particular branch of the constructor. Uh, one, one particular branch of, of the data type. Uh, and then, obviously, in a, in a larger context, you would also then turn, turn the, 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 the product type here into, into an H list of things. And then, so then you'd have a complete generic representation of stuff, and you can compute over it. So the big problem, so, okay, well, this, this should just work. So this should just compile. So let's see what happens when you just compile it. Um, so let's find the terminal. So project. Compile. Oh, what went wrong? <sighs> Could not find implicit value for. Right. Well, why? Okay. Well, let's let's have a look at the code. Does anybody know why? Oops. Come on. Uh, Well, let's 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 make a simple, simple permuta permutation of the code. This is just so awful. I, I it, it makes me cry. Um, Hang on, hang on. Well, hang on. No, no, not, not, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> let me let me explain what's going on. Um, <laughs> so, what's going on? Why does why does that work and, and and the other version doesn't? So, this is this is this is this is this is, this is one of the interesting things about working in the Scala compiler. Scala compiler. So, we can write beautiful, pure, typeful, functional, referentially transparent code in Scala. However, inside the Scala compiler, there is a huge amount of um, of, 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 of horrendous mutable state. It's not as bad as you've heard. So, uh, you know, I've, Paul, Paul Phillips, amongst other people, um, have, have, have certainly, you know, you could, you could be forgiven for, for, for taking away from his talks that, um, uh, that, that, that essentially the Scala compiler code base should be just destroyed with fire. And, uh, <laughs> but it, it isn't that bad. However, there is, there, is, there is a lot of mutable state. And one of the issues that we have is that basically the way that, so, Shape is generic depends on a macro API called um, known direct subclasses. Uh, known direct subclasses basically uh, runs at a particular point in the type checker, um, or at least macros run at a particular point in the type checker, where it's not always entirely known what the direct subclasses of a type are. And the reason it is is because basically, as the compiler type checks um, this, uh, the, these, these, these constructor types, they will, as it were, register themselves with their parent as, as, as being child classes um, of these things. So if the compiler has seen these um, data constructors before it hits uh, before it attempts to type check this, then it will see the right answer and it will compile. And if it doesn't, it will just see it will see the ADT, but it, it will it will as far as as far as that API call is concerned, it doesn't have any known direct subclasses, and hence the generic uh, the you know the the, the requirements of the generic. Uh, uh, in, implicit materializer aren't met, so you get you get this failure, and and it's a, it's a really fiddly problem, um, and uh, it had been I um, so if we go back here, uh, so this is this is the bug, and uh, basically uh, everybody, including Eugene and 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 Jason and Adrian, basically throwing their hands up and say this is unfixable, we can't fix it. Um, so the problem for me, obviously, is that, is that this is this is and, and it's not it's not this isn't the problem which just affects shapeless. It basically affects every single um, um, uh, every single macro based um, sort of serializer library of which there are many. And obviously, I think everyone should be using shapeless to do this kind of stuff, but but some people don't agree with me and they like to write their own. All of them, all of them have the same problem um, because because it's 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 the low level infrastructure in the macro API and in the way that those macros are executed within the context of the compiler, which break stuff. Um, so it turns out that it is possible to fix. Um, it's, it, it's not a perfect fix. Um, and I can perfectly well understand why 
Um, kind of Eugene doesn't really want to touch it. it it's, 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 it's not particularly pleasant. It's a 95% fix. There are circumstances where you can, there are ways that you can, you can, you can, you can uh, sort of define um, sort of biz bizarre ways of scattering the subtypes of the ADT around your source code. I mean, if you, if you, you, can, you, can, you can do some really weird things. You can have a sealed trait and then, then have a, a subtype of it in a, as a local definition in a local block and things like that. There are all kinds of weird stuff that, that it, it simply won't spot. But those will almost certainly be things which were, were just mistakes if you're actually using an AD, uh, this kind of mechanism to model an ADT. It's just wrong anyway, so it's, it's not a problem. So two things uh, the fix does. It, first, it makes means that you know basically all the cases I've ever seen where people have had this problem with shapeless are now fixed. And the cases where it's not fixed, you now actually get an error saying you've tried to call direct known subclasses. Um, however, um, after you did, someone came along and added themselves as another subclass. This is wrong. Um, so so that, that 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 hugely 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 helps. Uh, I think in this case. Um, so uh, more stuff. So the literal types, the SIP uh, 40 digit type or SIP 23 stuff, um, is is kind of fun. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of things. So there's some some of them. So it's, it's, it's sort of interesting because this is this is this is adding syntax for things which um, uh, has always existed in the Scala compiler, Re right back to before you know 2.0. Um, um, singleton types. Um, have always been a part of Scala's um, semantics. Um, however, there has never until recently been, been syntax to express singleton types for literal values, things like strings or integers or booleans or whatever. Um, Shapeless makes use of these um, to, to, to handle things like labels and records. Um, and, and it uses a, a bunch of fairly clunky, awkward macros to allow you to express uh, these types in situations where you desperately need to. Um, fortunately, in most cases, you, they're actually invisible and they're inferred and you never have to write them by hand. But it does mean that things like this, so this is a shapeless record, um, and this gives you a value um, of a type that you can't easily write. I mean, there are, there are things in, in shapeless currently with, um, um, which would allow you to write this type, but it would be really quite long-winded, and I didn't feel like writing it out. Um, but anyway, this gives you a, a type which is um, essentially a, um, a field type, this thing, which is a sort of a, a um, uh, which is basically, basically a, a, a kind of a pair type um, with, a, with a key and a value. Uh, it, the, the, the key itself is a phantom type in the, in the way that it works in shapeless, so it doesn't have any actual representation. Um, and the, 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 the inference here, when we're building the value, uh, it will infer the key to be the singleton type, so the unique type, which is the type of the string name as distinct from strings in general, um, uh, uh, associated with, with, with these values. Um, so you can't write the type, but you, uh, with, 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 with the literal type um, uh, extension, you are now able to write the type uh, like this. Um, let me just get rid of that so that we can just see some. Syntax highlighting. So this, this, is, this is the type it always was. Uh, it always was this type, but now we can actually write that type down. And that's, that's kind of a useful thing to have. It's not massively useful, but um, it's uh, given that, by and large, you, you expect these things to be inferred. But there are definitely situations where, uh, where this is valuable. People are using shapeless records a lot uh, internally to, 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 to shapeless-based um, uh, codecs. So I think this will be, uh, will be pretty useful for, for people writing those libraries. Hopefully, you're not going to see this, this kind of stuff in this context that much. There are some other really, really quite interesting uses, um, if I can just dig it out, uh, which uh, I quite like. So this is, this, is, this is kind of a fun example, uh, which makes use of singleton types for integers. Um, so this is, um, this is a, um, a type representing uh, integers, uh, uh, modular arithmetic. Um, so we can have here the type of uh, integers uh, modulo, uh, modulo sum number m. Um, so here we've got five mod. So, so this is this is this is uh, five in 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 this uh, uh, in this algebra. Um, so these are these are both typed as uh, modulo ten. We've got five. We've got nine, um, and uh, we can add these values um, because they belong to the same. Uh, family, and we'll get back uh, the expected modulo, uh, the, accept, the expect, expected result modulo 10. However, what we don't want to be able to do, we want to be able to make it statically 
uh, a static error um, that uh, 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 adding a, um, uh, a number mod 10 with a mod number mod 11. Um, we don't want that to happen. That's always, that's always an error. We want that to be a static error. And uh, using this kind of indexing, um, we get that immediately. And you can see that it's, it's very, very straightforward to read this off the signatures. Um, here we have the singleton type 10. Here we have the singleton type 11. So if we're doing the sum of 5 mod 10, uh, we're going to, this m here is going to be 10. Uh, the right-hand side, this value will be in this, this, sorry, this type will be inferred as the singleton type of 11. Oops, type error. And we're done. So this, this, this is a very, very lightweight, very, very simple way of expressing additional constraints um, on values uh, using types in a, in a way which I think is, is very natural. Um, this, is a, this is a kind of uh, uh, um, a situation that I, I, I actually imagine we, we might very well see appearing in, in end user code. I can see Eric nodding his head, and I'm sure imagining things he can do with this Inspire. Um, this also illustrates another thing, which is so this is, this is something which is going to clean up a lot of shapeless, this value of thing here. Um, this is because we know these are, are, um, uh, are singleton types. Um, we know that there is a one-one correspondence between a type and a value, uh, which means that if you if you know the type, you should be able to produce a value of that type. Um, so here we're able to, for example, uh, this 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 modular number uh, doesn't actually need to store as a value; it's modulus. Um, thank you. Um, so we can we can, uh, so th this this actually has a a, 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 not, a not insignificant runtime benefit uh, if you're if you're you know operating with with significant numbers of, of, of significant quantities of modular modular numbers you don't actually have to stash these things with um, uh, with 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 the with the with the base values that they're, they're working with which is which is useful. Um, so these things can just simply be be summoned by type. Um, now this gets rid of a whole ton of, of infrastructure which exists in Shapeless. Basically, this this eliminates um, a witness from Shapeless and, and all of the various uh, macros that are associated with it. They're 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 not they're not the, the ugliest macros in Shapeless by any means, but but they you know the fewer we can have the better in my opinion. And this is a this is a relatively I mean there's a lot of work done in Shapeless to make this stuff uh, um, as close to this as possible. Uh, it is much much easier to actually. Um, in fact, it's less, it was less work for me to kind of get this to work by fixing in the compiler than it was for me to actually work around the absences in, 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 in macros in Shapeless itself. So this is, this is a win for that, and it'll be a win for users of Shapeless as well. Um, so the one last thing... So, so, okay, so, that, so, um, so the last thing I want to show you is the, um, is the, is the other major um, obstacle to people when they start using... Um, uh, Shapeless, which is which is which is compile times. Um, so um, Aaron again sort of showed some examples of, of really interesting. I think you show, I think today you showed an example of one of the really really big types that that servant uh, uh, users of servant uh, use. And you were talking about having sort of um, you know products uh, sort of co-products of sort of 300 elements of products of 20 elements. That's kind of big. And if you I mean Shapeless can kind of represent this kind of stuff. But if, if at that sort of size, um, you're talking about compile times in tens of minutes or longer possibly. Um, and uh, you know, you know it, 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 it's it's a problem at that scale. Uh, and sometimes it's worth it. And sometimes it's basically you know you hit a point above. I don't know, a size 50, I think, with reasonable hardware, I think is probably about the biggest I would actually recommend people go unless they, they really need this stuff. But this puts some fundamental limits on, on what, what people can do with Shapeless. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, there is really no solution to this. I mean, there is no, there is no, well, the only solution is to write special case macros, which is something that I would really rather not do. I have done uh, it in a couple of cases to, to, to for, for, um, specific things which were causing real grief to, to, to people trying to index into large, into large types. Um, but ultimately, the mechanism that we want to use is, is the one that you write in, 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 in the code. So I'll show you an example of the kind of thing we're talking about here. Um, if I can just find it. Oh, wrong, 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 wrong. Right, here we go. So here's an example of... Actually, no, I did have another example. Uh, where is it? Ah. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, here we go. Okay. So, so this is an example of, of um, a shapeless selector. So this is this is the kind of thing that, that in one way or another you're using when you're indexing into a shapeless a shapeless uh, record or something like that. Um, so we have an H list. It's got it's got 
consists of you know, elements of three types. So this is the type signature. We want to select the Boolean element from that. Um, and um, uh, so this works fine. The, the mechanism for implementing the select method is to, is to essentially summon an instance of this selector type class. If you're in Aaron's talk, it's basically doing exactly the kind of stuff that Aaron was talking, uh, induction on the structure of the type. Um, so let's have a look at what happens when we try to scale this up. Um, if we find the right, yes, here we go. So here is here is um, here is uh, a copy and pasted version of of the implementation of selector H list and selector from from Shapeless, um, and here's uh, a some test examples of this. So this is what we're going to try and do something with. Right, OK, can we select <laughs> the Boolean at the end of a 500 element H list? Um, well, I, I'm not actually not going to try that with the vanilla Scala compiler. What I'm actually going to try is um, I'm going to try a slightly smaller example to start with. Um, so let's do that. OK, so this is going to be just 100, 100 integers. Um, <laughs> right, here we go. So, let's see how long this takes. It won't be, it won't be incredibly long. Um, I say hopefully. How long do I have left now? I, I'm over by two minutes, okay. Right, okay, so that, take, so that took 24 seconds. So I'm just going to very quickly turn that up to, a to 200. Um, actually, no, I'm going to reduce it to 50. <laughs> I'll go the other way. Um, where are we? Uh, there we go. Hang on. Oops. What did I do? Oh, crap. Right. So let's do that again. So that was 24 seconds. This is 50. Right, and that took 14 seconds. Um, uh, I was kind of hoping that was actually going to be uh, uh, super linear, but uh, I, I, guess, I guess it's too small an instance for that. Well, OK, I, what I can show you is a graph of what this actually looks like if you, if you plot this out. So this is, this is what happens with that uh, if we increase the size of the H list. As you can see, it is very, very horribly uh, super linear. Um, if we'd run it for 500, we would have taken on this machine. Uh, that's quite a long time. That's seconds. So um, uh, that's 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 more than 10 minutes, um, which is really, I'm sure you agree, not not particularly practical. Okay. So the fix, on the other hand, uh, is to um, So let's let's do all five hundred. Right. So this is with this is with the a very very early proof of concept um, uh, optimization for specifically for inductive patterns of implicit resolution. Um, so this is the full set. Takes. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is this is competing against ten minutes. So, yes. What do we get there? We got uh, thirty. Uh, what's what's that? Twenty two. Uh, Twenty two seconds. Okay. 
Um, and this is the curve that we get from this. So this is, as you can see, this is, this is, this is scaling rather better, I think, really. Um, so I think between, between the SI7046 fix and between uh, uh, and this, I think there's a whole class of things which are currently, shapeless would be ideal for, except that they're, they're, they're just not feasible because, because of the compile times and, and because of, of issues, with, um, uh, issues with bugs in the compiler. I think, I think addressing these uh, works. I think the thing that's really fascinating for me is that, um, is that um, actually Working on compilers and libraries simultaneously had some really, really interesting effects. Um, you can, you can, you can. Uh, if, if you, if you're, if you're con completely constrained by 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 um, by your language and the language implementation, obviously that puts limits on the kinds of things that that, that you're able to do. Uh, if you can imagine co-evolving the language and the libraries together, I think that gives us an awful lot of possibilities. And the thing I want to try and impress on people, I mean, look at that. That is clearly that is clearly a search algorithm uh, in need of a lot of a lot of care and attention to be able to get. I mean, the the, the actual delta in the code to get that, admittedly for a, for a fairly special case, it's quite small. There is an awful lot of, of low-hanging fruit available. There are things that, if people have particular problems, the chances are no one else will have looked at them. They can dig into the code, and, 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 and there is a really, really strong possibility that you can make a really, really big impact, which will help a lot of people. So I, re I really want to encourage people to kind of join in and, and, and help working on the compiler, because everybody wants you to do it. The Lightbend team want you to do it. I want you to do it. It will help everyone. So anyway, that's my lot. Thank you.